two, one. Okay, and we're recording, and I am with Andreas. How are you, Andreas? And I'm with Sunny. Sunny, how are you doing? Well, me, <laughs> man. I can, I can, I can, I can go to my balcony and show people where we used to live. Where we well, yeah, right. We used to be neighbors. Yes, we're still neighbors, but uh, you know, it's still not, now it's a drive away. It's not like a, a walk away. Exactly, exactly. So how, how are you no, doing? Uh, how are you doing, brother? I haven't seen you for for like uh, far too long. You know, I've seen you through camera, but you know, I haven't been there to hug you and mm -hmm. go up and down Young Street and uh, yeah, man. Oh, I'm missing, and, I'm missing, I'm missing everyone. This is why I'm the, doing this this Zoom thing and everything, right? What's that? And the coffee, having coffee together, coffee and, coffee and yeah, and hanging and, out, talking about you know, crypto, Bitcoin, for everything and everybody, huh? Yeah. And you know, you know, that's actually, it's funny because I, I usually start with like, where did we meet? Do you remember when we met or where we met? Well, well, yeah. I mean, uh, you were doing this uh, Bitcoin, uh, I wouldn't call them even meetups because they became conferences. <laughs> but uh, it was meetups that ended up in mini conferences that became large conferences. Uh, at Mars, and I remember you coming with your suit and tie and everything. You were like styling, right? Not that you're not styling now, but yeah, you were even more styling at that time when you were a poor guy. The Bitcoin was only like two. <laughs> that was only two fifty. But that's how we met. Bitcoin was only two two fifty when we met. I don't know. It was like yeah, man. It must have been early. But I do remember maybe, those Mars. Maybe maybe, maybe it was a little bit more, but it was definitely lower than a thousand, right? I remember those events, man. Those were those were the days, and those days will return, uh, hopefully sooner than later. Uh, but it's it, I remember that we, we we had so many people at those events that I remember I think, at Mars you studied, and it was like a capacity, and then the next event was the young capacity, and they start yelling to you. The Mars uh, for those people who don't know, Mars is uh, it's a big uh, incubation center next to the University of Toronto, and it. It occupies a very large building. It looks like a hospital, right? Mm. And uh, Sunny used to rent uh, the uh, used to rent the uh, uh, main uh, auditorium that was feeding I don't know like two three hundred people. But then you went uh, within the second or third event, you went beyond capacity and they start yelling at you that. Uh, I did. Uh, I did. Uh, yeah, we we broke the fire the fire code uh, regulatory the fire code, code there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had way too. We had people standing. It was like it was insane. Yeah, yeah, it was like yeah, packed. Yeah. We had like two hundred people standing behind the correct three correct. four hundred people sitting. What but a time! Were nice events. There were very nice events for uh, for the local community, for you know, for the ecosystem. And I these go back uh, to what two sixteen two seventeen. I remember you doing those things. Right. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad some people remember because uh, they, they took a lot, you know, they take a lot of energy, but it's just, you know, you, you've helped me with some of them too, right? With the ones that later, the uh, later. Uh, they, they, they take a lot out of you, but they, they, I don't know, they feel like important to me for some reason, like to just no, to connect they are with people. Important and actually, if you ask me, uh, some of these events are memories that I hold in my life, right? Mm. Because mm. the head, you know, at that time, not many people knew what cryptocurrency was, what Bitcoin was. Now, even the great grandmother of the average Joe knows what Bitcoin is. Oh, of course. Time, uh, <laughs> we were all pushing and you took this initiative to make it a little bit more formal and bigger, right? We're all pushing the other ground, but you take this. So that's how we met. I mean, it's not actually we met. I saw you standing at the podium started the event and then i think it was the second event that i came to you i say hey brother it's like uh, let's go out and you told me you live like just a few blocks away at that time yeah and and the rest is <laughs> and, the, and the rest is history right yeah. so 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 i okay so i you know um like just as like a tldr obviously you've done a lot in the crypto space you know you're at the university of toronto you're a professor there etc cetera, etc cetera. we're going to get into all that and you know you've done some exciting work with uh, that 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 was pretty public and and a lot of people heard about it. So we're going to get into that that work that you're doing uh, with the Canadian government or those at the Bank of Canada, right. and, and and so or like the the paper as well. Super excited about that. But but to me, I always say all this stuff is just like ones and zeros, Bitcoin, but like all of it comes down to the stories behind. Uh, the people, right, that help Bitcoin build Bitcoin, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so 
you know, really curious, you know, kind of what, what, what does your story look like? Like I, I was telling you earlier, some people start with their great grandfather. Some people start with their first job uh, or anything in between. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Where, where, where does your, uh, where does your story begin? Well, I'm Greek and uh, the audience has not forgive me because I will vape here and there, unless you want me to go out in the cold and have a cigarette because nobody in Greece smokes, but I'm Greek originally. So you're talking life story here. You're not talking Bitcoin story. Well, actually, no, let, let me just preface a little bit. Let's say, no, definitely life story. But but I do feel, and I could be wrong, and maybe it doesn't apply to you, but most of the people that I've interviewed, Bitcoin is a bit of a singularity event, like in the sense that it, you know, before and after learning oh, about it, I see. Yeah. It, it, it does change a bit of your paradigm, I, okay, right? That, that's, a, that's a good point. So, so, you know, I'm not saying it applies to you, but I just care, but usually I ask it from that perspective is right, like, well, tell yeah. us your story before learning about Bitcoin and then kind of after learning about yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah, segues yeah, into, you know, so your project. So believe it or not, Bitcoin was not a singularity for me, right? Uh, you were a singularity for the Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Go, uh, go ahead. Okay. For one thing, and you know, you're not coming from Boston or Los Angeles. You come from Toronto. Uh, as, as a friend of mine has called me, I belong in the Toronto cartel. And that's Ethereum, of course, right? Uh, the Toronto cartel is all, all around Ethereum. This is not to say we don't have the special Bitcoin, of course, but uh, being uh, in Ethereum and being part, you know, of the early days of Ethereum, the meetups, uh, living this experience, um, seeing the transformation of Ethereum. Uh, we're all Ethereum junkies up here in Toronto, but we do have, I know, I mean, you, you've, I'm sure you have faced it also yourself. There's sometimes uh, animosity between the Bitcoin and Ethereum communities. Uh, I mean, I know Ethereum guys that will kill their mother if they say something against Ethereum, right? Uh, obviously, I'm not like that. I'm not like that, and obviously, if anybody wants to go back and understand uh, uh, what we experience today, you know, we all uh, reference uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, right? So there's no question about it. But uh, surprisingly, um, Bitcoin was not my singularity moment. Uh, my singularity moment was um, essentially 17 years, not even 17, like uh, 15, 16 years before. Uh, when I was, I, I was doing my PhD at the University of Illinois, uh, it was, uh, I, I joined there January 93. And uh, later on that summer, I got involved with Mosaic uh, that later became Netscape, right? And Mosaic was the first browser and uh, small world. It was the design project of Mark Adirson. Now everybody knows the Adirson Horowitz fund. Uh, and Adirson, after he moved to California, I guess he gained a lot of weight and lost a lot of hair. But at that time, I was a graduate student, and he was another graduate student at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And that was his design project, actually, Mosaic, right? Um, and there's a funny story over there. He went to this professor whose name was Simon Kaplan. Uh, he's not there anymore. He left for somewhere in Australia. But I was TAing for Simon at that time. I was a teaching assistant. And uh, he said, hey, professor, I want to do this design project. And he explained Mosaic and Simon turned to him and says, this is a pile of crap. Uh, so it didn't fruition. And then he went to NCSA, this stands National Center for Supercomputer Applications. And that's the guys that sponsored uh, Mark and started doing, hey, my daughter is like, <laughs> unfortunately, but uh, she grew up okay. from what I remember. Here, let me, let me pause it. I play. Here you go, Agua. Sorry, okay. man. Yeah, I have there to say this with my daughter. She's seven and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time she sees me on Zoom, I don't know why this must be magnet. She yeah. jumped to me. So I'm having a call with several banks, and all of a sudden I had the ringing. My daughter coming, yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know like that. She, she climbs on me like a monkey, chip monkey. It's exactly the same thing. So yeah. it's something with Zoom that I like. So anyhow, going back to that uh, story, I was telling you, um, going back to that story, um, what happened is that, uh, uh, so Mark started working for NCSA and I was involved with Mosaic. And then I had an offer to join Netscape in 94. I didn't, I wanted to finish my PhD. But it was the first time, uh, because you know the first browser came from the University of Illinois that I started understanding 
what it means to bring communities together, right? Uh, communities of people, because at that time, I already had the bachelor's and the master's, uh, my master's from Los Angeles, my bachelor's from Greece. At that time, I remember for me to send email, I was communicating with my girlfriend in Greece, right? Through email, it was like a whole damn process. Go to the university, log in. Uh, hey, Andreas, I did, I said, you've got to give me 30 seconds. I'm going to go put her upstairs. Sorry, man. Yeah, she's, yeah, 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 yeah. she's in a weird no, no, mood no. today. Well, just give me 30 seconds. Sorry, no. boss. This hasn't happened before. We love one. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Okay, so yeah, that, you were saying. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was speaking about Netscape and Mosaic, or isn't it? Then Netscape, and then, you know, this little thing that everybody's using right now allow people to get together from all four corners of the world, right? Mm. And then what happened to me... I was a young uh, man at that time. I was believing that this would be the epitome of democracy. I was so excited. And I was also, uh, as, as you know, in my teens and early 20s, I was involved in the music industry. And um, uh, I started doing journalism on the internet in 94, right? I was one of the first people ever to publish uh, interviews, uh, musicians and stuff uh, on the internet. And that was so, so much liberating for me. Like I was a young guy, I was thinking that this is gonna change the world, is gonna introduce democracy, is gonna uh, spread equality and freedom and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's very sad because 25, 26 years after now, you see Facebook, Twitter, and all these social media essentially manipulating uh, internet in a way that uh, they're shaping uh, beliefs, they're shaping politics, they're shaping pretty much everything. And, um, and definitely part of, of my heart died by seeing this thing evolving like that, right? And I was so excited. Um, the next uh, prophetic moment as we move towards the singularity that you said, um, it was BitTorrent. Right, uh, and whether we like it or not, BitTorrent is the epitome of decentralization, right? Now, Bitcoin adds to it and Ethereum adds even more. But I was involved in the music industry from 83 until 97, late 97. And I knew everything about, I mean, I walked the red carpet, I've been to the Grammy Awards, I've worked for the Grammy Awards, uh, actually 95. Um, and I saw a lot of corruption in that industry, right? I mean, I can go hours and hours and hours in that. Uh, and a lot of candid stories also, right? Uh, because I worked in Hollywood. And then uh, BitTorrent came. I mean, first was Napster, then was LimeWire and Casa. I'm sure you remember those. Uh, but these were not P2P because for me to use Napster or Casa, I had to ping the Casa server and they had to give me somebody that has the file name that I have, and then I can download from him. And that was P2P over there. But there was a centralized database that was holding everything, and that's how they were able, the authorities, to track them down and sue them, and eventually close them. And then BitTorrent came in 2000 or early 2001, I don't remember, and damn, it changed everything. And when I left the industry, the music industry, that was my hobby. In 97, late 97, it was like a 50, 55 billion dollar industry. And fast forward 25 years, 24 years, today it's barely 25 billion. Out of which half of it is Google Music and Apple Music, iTunes, and all that kind of stuff. I should be saying that I'm not using none of them because I still download, right? But I shouldn't be saying that, but um, on the camera, but I just did. I think it's legal in Canada to download, right? Or I can VPN and download from wherever I want. <laughs> but uh, and this with respect to the artist, actually, uh, because I do pay my dues going to concerts. I do pay my dues buying merchandise. But people have to realize, and that's what we're also realizing when it comes to the banking sector and Bitcoin. That I mean, people get surprised that when you're a musician, you sign a new contract. Do you know how much you get, uh, Sunny? as a new musician, you sign it back in the 90s, you sign uh, uh, with EMI or you sign with Sony or with Capital, how much you get from the CD? Just give, tell me something. One how to 5%, is, 10%, huh? one to 5%, I'm guessing, I don't know. I'm guessing it's unfair. 3%, yeah. 
Three percent. Wow. Three, okay. three and a half. I mean, of course, if you're Madonna or you do, you got to strike like a special deal because they need you. Uh, but the new artist gets like three, four percent, five percent very rarely. Hmm. So the question is now is where the remaining 95 percent goes. Hmm. The remaining 95 percent goes to all the intermediaries, basically, right? And some of them, especially the record labels, and I remember the guy is coming one day, the record executive was coming, not anymore, was coming with his high-end Mercedes, the other day with his high-end Porsche, and he had his like a uh, resort of Malibu and da 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 da. And that was a very corrupt and Bitcoin changed that. So uh, I wouldn't call in my case, Bitcoin, uh, being the Bitcoin was cool when I saw it, right? When I first saw it, uh, what I really got hyped about was Ethereum because it was allowing me to program, right? It was allowing me to create. And then it was at the point of Ethereum when I saw that, that this aha moment came and said, oh man, that's BitTorrent all over again. But now it's not about music. It's about pretty much everything. And we don't need now people to do the job for us. Uh, I don't need, but we can have like machines doing the job for us in a very transparent and decentralized manner. And for me, that was the 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 great uh, discovery of this uh, decentralization, basically. And you so you said you're from Greece, right? So I assume you came you came to Toronto like quite some time ago. Uh, what 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 what? Any? I'm just curious. What, what did you? What was it that you studied? Uh, in Greece, I studied computer science and computer engineering. Interesting. Okay. Then, 91, I left uh, for the University of Southern California to do my PhD, master's, and then PhD. Mm. And part of the reason is because Hollywood was there. It was Los Angeles, right? It's a good school. I mean, it's a top 20 school, but it, it was not like a top three school, right? And I went there. I did well. I was there during the riots, the Rodney King riots also. Mm. Uh, it was very, uh, it was a big revelation for me being a young guy. Uh, and then uh, after my master's, I realized, I, I knew that I wanted to be faculty, but after my master's, it became even stronger. And I went to U of I, because it's a top three school. And then uh, 99, I just left the United States and I came to Canada because of the job over here at the University of Toronto. And now I'm computer engineering and computer science, actually. I'm joined faculty. You're, you're uh, at the University of Toronto, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so okay. in terms of like, so Bitcoin, uh, so I guess when you saw it, you thought, okay, this is the same thing as BitTorrent, which I had, a, I mean, that was kind of a similar feeling I had This too. came with Ethereum, now with Bitcoin, actually. That's kind of funny that you say. Say again, say again. Uh, the, the, this revelation in my mind. Oh, you came with Ethereum. With Ethereum, because Bitcoin, yeah. you know, I didn't, I mean, I started reading about it. First time I read it, it was like, uh, I remember it was early, no, it was summer of 2010 or mm. spring of 2010, right? Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, I was in Greece at that time um, because I was also teaching in a Greek university that semester, right? And um, and I, it was on a Greek newspaper, actually. And they were saying, oh, these, it was a small column, you know, it was like, uh, you know, like six, seven paragraphs, whatever. It's like, oh, there's this new currency called Bitcoin. And I remember that was like, uh, Spring of uh, 2010, right? Uh, spring of 2010. And then um, I didn't pay that much attention, but then it was summer of 2011 that I started talking to one of my colleagues here at the University of Toronto, um, who's also the CEO of Wanda. I don't know if you remember Wanda, the Forex, the big Forex company. Okay. It acquired like a couple of years ago, but very big Forex company. It was the founder. So summer of 2000, summer of 2011, we started talking and reading slowly. And it was around 2011 that I started getting more involved with Bitcoin, right? Oh, but okay. But then you said you never really, uh, Bitcoin hadn't really caught your imagination. It was more Ethereum, right? And so yeah, that was when, so when did that come? 2015, 2016? Yeah, it was, it was around 2013 when I met Vitalik. Uh, and then we start talking about, uh, you know, going to meetups and, you know, meeting the local people that most of them, you know, uh, it was 2013 
that start realizing that you know the mechanism behind Bitcoin is a decentralized mechanism that can do way more than just validating something, right? You can execute programs, you can do this, you can do that, you understand, right? So it was at that time that I started drawing parallels between BitTorrent, because it's a completely decentralized network. Of course, there's no consensus with BitTorrent, a completely decentralized network and essentially Ethereum, because Ethereum was more functional. I mean, Bitcoin can barely write any smart contract on it, right? It has a very restricted uh, language, right? So it was around 2013, late 2013, that started realizing that, hey, this is a big torrent on steroids, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. And then, so once you had, so at that time, are you already a professor at U of T? Uh, 99, yeah. 99, I joined U of T. Oh, wow. You joined in 99. Okay. Yeah. So wait, how long have you been there then? So that's, uh, oh my Long-ing God, that's like 20, 22 years, man. 20, or, like this August is going to be the 22nd year. Yeah. Closing 32 years. Interesting. I started my electrical engineering degree in Nervousville, Alberta, and then I finished my last couple of years at U of T. So I got, I got a glimpse into uh, what it's like to be a student there. Uh, it's a fun campus. Um, so, so what's, uh, so how does, how does a professor, you know, that's like been in this, like been doing the professor thing for so long, you've seen these like emergence of, you know, you seem like you have a, you had a colorful back background, you know, you were in music, you kind of saw the music kind of industry, uh, grow with the BitTorrent kind of fueling it and Apple and, you know, I, iPhone yeah. and all that kind of stuff was really just uh, what 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 enabled Apple in a big way to get turbo boosted into, you know, the mainstream consciousness. And then, and then, okay, so now you're a professor, you see this uh, Ethereum thing, you see this Bitcoin thing and you're like, okay, there, this is something that there's a big opportunity, but what, what, where, where does your mind go next? Like, how do you you know, make a move or whatever? How do you get, like, become okay, a part a of the point. community? What yeah, let me turn off the heater for a second so I don't boil it. it. It's a, so my my uh, <clears throat> my uh, research before that was in the area of, uh, of uh, synthesis and verification of uh, circuits, right? The integrated circuits that we have on our phone, computer, and so forth. So I spent pretty much 20 years working in that area. And then the 2000s, I also had a small startup um, with like a dozen of people doing CAD tools, design computer chips and so forth, right? And um, so being the CEO of the startup, I spent a lot of time doing things that, you know, reading economics, writing business plans. And so I already had done a transition towards of understanding economics, right? From being a computer scientist, essentially, right? Uh, so for me, like both Bitcoin and Ethereum were very interested because they were, first of all, is the epitome of computer science and cryptography. And my background comes from theoretical computer science, right? So I do love cryptography. I do love consensus algorithms and all that kind of stuff, right? You said, you say epitome, right? Is that what you mean when you say? Epitome, epitome. Mm. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it is. But yeah, so, okay, yeah. so carry on, carry on. So how, what do you do then? And then it was uh, around 2013 when my startup closed its pretty much cycle. It was around 2013 that my startup went through like a, an acquisition process. And then I was left without a job. I mean, startup job, of course. I mean, I had the one at the university. Uh-huh. Then I said to myself, wow, I've been doing this 20 years. I mean, you know, Miles Davis, the singer, right? Miles Davis changed music four times. Changed music in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And every time he was moving to a new genre of music, he would never play his old songs again, right? The only time that Miles Davis played his songs again was like after he came back from the hiatus in mid 80s, that he did play again part of his old songs. But every decade that he was pushing music to a new direction, he would never go back and play his old songs. So I had 20 years doing that stuff. The whole thing was so exciting for me, like with Ethereum and Bitcoin. It was like computer science, meeting computer engineering, meeting economics, meeting law, meeting social structure, meeting, it was like, oh my God, I say, you know, I'm quitting my previous job. I'm in my previous area and I'm gonna be now working. And it was around 2.15, 
that I said to myself, let's do the effort. It, it's going to take a couple of years to switch my research at the University of Toronto oh. completely from what I'm doing. Yeah, because now I don't do nothing. Uh, I haven't done any work on uh, camp. Oh, so I, you're, 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 all your UFT, your, your research now is completely focused on this stuff? For the last three, four years, yeah. Wow. Four years, yeah. So I, I published my first paper. It was on oracles. I will start working on it in 2017. It was published in 2018. Uh, I published some leftover work that I had from what I was doing before. And I don't have any, I haven't hired any student to do what I was doing for the last four years. So all these students I'm hiring are for blockchain, yeah. Okay, so then, interesting. So how do you, I guess, switch gears and like actually, you know, foyer into this space though. Like, okay, so I mean, you said, so are you, so you're now fully engaged in all your research. So do you, you is spend, there anything else? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You spend like years and years reading stuff about this new area, right? It's an investment. Andres, do you remember what your first computer was? It was an Amstrad, Amstrad 512. Amstrad. <laughs> and yeah. so did you grow up with computers as well? Or did you see it and see computers uh, kind of later on in your life? No, my dad got me an Atari, but it was like a game console, right? Back in the early 80s, whatever that was, or late 70s. Um, but a computer, computer is when I got as an undergraduate at school that I got my first computer that was in... Uh, Late uh, 1986, my first year of university. That Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So, okay, so I guess um, in terms of, so the first kind of third of this interview is really about your story. So just curious, is there anything else on that front that you wanted to share? And just before we switch into more technical, geeky stuff. Uh... Um, no, that's fine. That's fine. There's a lot of stories to go from the music industry, but let's leave them outside. They're cool. Extra. X-rated even for YouTube. X, yeah, yeah. Did you hear this morning? I woke up. I heard CoinDesk YouTube YouTube channel got banned from from uh, from YouTube, and then why? I, I don't know. I don't know. Everything's getting banned. But then, but then they came back. I think I just an hour ago. I think I saw them again. So I don't know. But there was like an article about it even on CoinDesk. It's pretty funny. Um. Anyways, okay. So so great. That's uh. We'll, we'll stop there. Now let's maybe switch gears into I don't know just more technical stuff. So what's been your 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 kind of story within you know the Ethereum, Bitcoin, your research that U of T? What's what's kind of how does how is the arc of that you know story look like there? So with Ethereum, with U of T, what I'm doing today, what in particular? Well, I mean, just to maybe hit us up with the main high, uh, kind of milestones that gets you to this you know this big project that you're working so on the, or are you, the are you... main milestone was like working back in the days 214 with uh the local people over here to build ethereum right and you know with anthony glorio Vitali. so you were a part of that like you helped with like before was, ethereum yeah, was even the, launched the early of the early 2014 until interesting summer. yeah because then vitalik around september he moved to switzerland Right. Then he got surrounded by people. And then myself, I had a personal story that I took like a year, year and a half of my life. Uh, so I was not as uh, flexible to travel anymore. Um, but uh, I got involved with Ethereum like from late 2013, actually. I remember downloading the very early version. I'm sure I have it on my hard drive, the white paper of Ethereum. That was a thing late November 2013 or early December. Because I was flying to Japan later that uh, month, and I remember I was reading it in the Japanese train, actually, in the JR, as they call it in Japan. So that was, for me, a very, very uh, shocking moment. Ethereum was a particular, and I still remain, I think, I mean, um, you know, I'm usually candid. I think Ethereum did some tactical mistakes. Um, as they were building, that they're paying this price today, right? Uh, I can go on and on and on with, when it comes to scalability, when it comes to selecting uh, the smart contract language. I think there were tactical mistakes because they were rushing to get it out, to be honest. Uh, but um, that was the point that, you know, I started getting, I saw a lot of meat, a lot of juice into switching my research into this area, right? I saw like a humongous amount of potential because Bitcoin, you know, it's great for what it is, but still it doesn't offer the same kind of innovation that Ethereum does, right? Ethereum opens 
I'm not saying that because I love, you know, or I was part of it, but it does offer because of the smart contract the programming, a lot of potential that Bitcoin doesn't offer, right? Mm. Uh, and then um, I got involved with a couple of smaller projects. I don't even remember the names actually. Uh, Media Shifter was one of them. They were trying to do, uh, that was in 2016, I think. Uh, they were trying to do blockchain and uh, fake news actually. Um, and then around late 2016, mid 2016, I started reading about uh, different reports that were coming from central banks, right? And especially mm -hmm. from the Bank of Canada. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Something that people don't know, Bank of Canada is one of, of by far the most sophisticated several banks when it comes to blockchain technology and digital currency. And mm -hmm. I don't say that because I live in Canada, I don't say that because we live in Canada, but I say that because it is the truth. Actually, they did some of they did the uh, project Jasper, which remains one of the most comprehensive uh, DLT uh, central bank. Uh, projects they started in 215, believe it or not, right? And then 216, I got aware of Project Jasper in uh, by the Bank of Canada, and I started reading about it. Uh, I started following what uh, the European, the ECB, European Central Bank, was doing with Japan, with the Bank of Japan. Uh, it was the Project Stella, uh, and somehow I don't know why, but I, I started getting involved with like uh, CBDCs. They were not CBDCs even as a terminology at that time, right? Uh, but with the writings of the several bands. So I would say the last four years, I've been reading day and night. And, you know, it's a very complex problem because it's not only technology. Actually, I would say technology is the easiest part, right? Uh, there's a lot of regulation, a lot of um, impact of uh, to monetary policy, to fiscal policy, to politics. All those things get mixed up together. I would say... The, uh, to when it comes to CBDCs, the central bank digital currency, the technology is the easiest part, right? Mm -hmm. All the other layers are what they're adding a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, overhead, right? Um, and then in 2018, I found myself start writing economics, and I, in 2018 I wrote uh, and somebody can find it actually online. I wrote a proposal to the IMF. Mm. Uh, to digitize the special drawing rights. Are you familiar with what the special drawing right is? No. The special drawing right, I mean, believe it or not, is a currency that has been uh, introduced uh, by the IMF in the late 60s uh, at the time that they knew that that dollar and gold, they don't go together anymore, that the United States is, is generating big deficits, right? And this, the SDR was uh, announced by the IMF. And the IMF is not the IMF per se, it's all the countries that comprise the IMF, right? Uh, they voted for it. So they, uh, they released the special drawing rights and that was supposed in 1978 to become the currency reserve and never became, right? Uh, in 1971, in August, Nixon disassociated the price of gold with the price of the dollar. And then we had the free floating currencies. So in uh, 2018, in July 2018, I submitted a proposal to the IMF uh, to digitize the SDR. Uh, and I was surprised because a year after, it's called Special Drawing Rights in a New Decentralized Century. And uh, a year after, in June of 2019, I received an email by a friend says, hey, Facebook is releasing this thing, Libra, right? It was like 20 something of June 2019. And essentially what they were doing to a large extent, they were digitizing the special drawing rights. The original Libra coin was a coin that we based on a basket of five currencies, just like the SDR is, right? And it was like, oh, damn, man. It's like, and I didn't make my, pro and actually if you go to Archive, because I put my proposal on the Archive, at that time, I didn't want to make it public in 2018. But the same day that Libra was announced, I archived also my proposal. But if you read the proposal, you will see that it's submitted July 2018 to the IMF because the IMF cool. had conference at that time, right? Cool. At Georgetown. Um, and I found myself, I don't know, talking to several banks and, and, and doing all these kind of things that some people would say boring, but I find very exciting since then. 
I hey, it is what it is. Uh, I find it pretty fascinating, to be honest. Um, I find all this stuff interesting. Um, you know, my my quest uh, into Bitcoin ten whatever eleven years ago was really around uh, what is money. You know, and so I mean, CBDCs like by and large, most people out there would consider the Canadian dollar or the U.S. dollar money. So the fact that you're looking at the problem set through that lens, I'm very fascinated. So how do you so what next what's what happens like how do we how do we eventually get into you know kind of this like crazy situation that happened a couple of weeks ago where you know you're there was it there was a coin desk article about the whole thing right yeah it went it there was a lot of media about it so yeah so several banks i mean the um the watershed like central banks like many several banks for the last five years they're looking at blockchain technology right and they're looking at cryptocurrencies or digital currencies, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, the moment that struck everybody was the moment that Facebook announced Libra. And I talked to Facebook also. I'm quite good friends with both uh, Christian Catalini, the economist. He's a professor at MIT, but he's on a leave of absence and the technical team of Facebook mostly those guys that they do the uh, the move language. So I'm quite familiar with that, right? And and actually I hosted uh, Facebook at the Fields Institute, the uh, seminar back cool. in January a month ago and a week ago, they, they gave two talks about uh, DM, right? And uh, so the watershed moment was 219 because all of a sudden you have Facebook. Facebook has 1.7 billion daily users and 2.7 billion monthly users, unique users. So all of a sudden, I mean, China is not 1.7 billion people, right? Let alone 2.7 billion. That's like 40% of the world, whatever it is, 35% of the world, right? So that was a watershed moment for all the central banks because all of a sudden, Facebook becomes the biggest central bank of them all, if you think about it, right? If there is a coin. This has a tremendous impact onto the monetary policy, onto privacy, and obviously, as you know, Facebook is not the is not the best uh, <laughs> candidate when it comes to privacy, right? Uh, yeah. And security of your data, right? Yeah. It's not the best boy. Hey, Andres, can I, can I share something with you real quick? Yeah, of course. So last year, was it last year? I don't know. I forget exactly when, but about a year ago, I went to Paris for the OECD. Uh, blockchain conference so last year no because most likely two years ago i think it was yeah. i'm trying to remember i'm losing track of time no it wasn't last year yeah it was last two years ago when i was working at kraken um they, because of everything with uno coin i was actually a lady was nice enough to invite me uh, to speak <laughs> it was i spoke in like a side panel type of thing it wasn't that big of a deal but um what my kind of most exciting moment in that conference was when I was in a room and there must have been, I forget, at least a couple of that, maybe at least 2000 or something people and yeah. they're all regulators and on stage goes up the gentleman who's like the face of the Libra, you know, whole project. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> I forget the guy the from Switzerland, right? Uh, yeah, 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 that's the guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this I don't know personally, but uh, David Marcus or whatever, right? There was actually a gentleman from Bank of Canada there as well who like kind of went after him on stage with a bunch of other people from the central bank. Anyways, Do you um, have a guy from Bank of Canada, Dinesh? I think I have, it wasn't an Indian guy. I know who you're talking about, by the way. I think I follow him on Twitter, but there was, a, there was, no, it was a Caucasian guy. Okay. Um, but it, Elaine? I'm sorry, Timothy. Timothy. Lane. I think it might have been. I gotta check. I have his business card, but but anyways, but it was such a interesting moment, though. Like I, I'm yeah. pretty sure I got it on tape. Maybe not. Um, but it was like that gentleman on stage. Imagine now. Imagine <laughs> him explaining, and he did the most amazing job. At least in my view, like he was yeah. answering all the questions. So so, but I agree with you. I agree with you. Like Bitcoin, you can choose to ignore it. Right, you can choose to ignore it. It's yeah. so small, it's irrelevant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. You cannot ignore Facebook. It's in no. your, it's on your phone. Your mom, no. your grandmother. I mean, you are literally. I mean, I I don't like Facebook, but for most people, it's like, it's you know, it's like a love love yeah, you're relationship. Not, you're not big on Facebook. <laughs> You're not, I'm not big on Facebook either. I have <laughs> me account. too. I I, I, got I know. I know. I know. I'm not big. I have an account so people can connect with me, but you know, I'm not that. You know. 
Especially, so, but, but I agree. But back to your story. I want to just yeah, that was I, like, I agree that with was you a, that Facebook that was, was a, that was a shocking moment, right? Shocking <laughs> yeah. moment. This is like this is like you being, you know, as a settled bank, you know, you control everything. This is like you being the king of the world, and all of a sudden you see UFOs over the sky. You say, "Oh man, <laughs> you know, it's over! It's over!" You know, <laughs> UFOs over the sky. Yeah, <laughs> we all hear about UFOs, but you've never been outside, right? <laughs> and you look at the sky, and you see little things flying. I mean, you're seeing pictures. Movies, but going to see with your eyes and it doesn't look really perfect but it looks like it, that's how it looks it's so right? true okay yeah, yeah instead of bank. so that was like and since then since 2019 I mean it's not a coincidence I mean I remember it was like June 24 25 something like that that Facebook came with the announcement within four hours there was an invitation to them to go to the Senate and Congress and testify within a few hours same day. And then next morning I woke up and the ECB, the European Central Bank had also done an announcement about Facebook. So everybody got shitted all over and it's not a figure of speech because they knew that would be real trouble. Uh, and then there was a race for banks to develop CBDCs, right? Uh, China is quite ahead. China is already testing the system in three cities in China. And because I'm very close with the Chinese project, I mean, I don't disclose more. It's called the Conflux uh, Network. I'm close to them. But uh, uh, I do have information. I do see the, the, the Chinese Central Bank has been working on it for the last pretty much seven years. Very, seven very, years, okay. Seven years, yeah, diligently, right? Some say even from 2013. But it's a payment system, if you think about it. Uh, today, I was talking with a very large bank in Brazil, Banco de Brazil. Mm. is the biggest bank in Brazil. And actually, I was not aware that Brazil released the PIX system, P-I-X, which, uh, which is payments. Uh, with QR codes, somehow similar to what you guys do in India with the Adhar system, right? But it's very fast. It takes like seconds to settle. It takes like four or five seconds to settle this uh, payment system. The so, Adhar, you mean, right? The, uh, the, uh, the, the identity card? No, the, Adhar, the, Adhar is, the Adhar is a little bit more evolved system because you guys have also the biometrics and the id and everything. i guess we're going to get to that right later right you're going to yeah, talk about yeah. that a little bit okay but the big system in brazil is a payment system hmm. that you know it works it, it came alive in november 2020 just like four months ago uh and uh it's a payment system so instead of it's like imagine you, your phone becomes your debit card right and it's a payment system and it's work very similar to what DCP is doing in China, if you think about it, right? Um, and now going back to the specific question that you asked, in April, so I knew the Bank of Canada people, some of them were like a couple of calls. And then in April of 2020, the Bank of Canada did a competition, an academic competition for universities to give uh, proposals for CBDCs. Actually, before that, in February of 2020, and it's a very nice document that I suggest for everybody to read, because again, not because I live in Canada, Bank of Canada is very sophisticated when it comes to digital currencies. In February of 2020, they released the contingency plan for a digital currency. It's like a 15 page, whatever document that they say, what are the conditions that they will make us release a digital currency, right? It's a very well-written plan. In April, two months later, <clears throat> they, they started an academic competition. There were many big universities also from the United States, like MIT was there, Cornell was there. Um, there was a joint call for Q&A. Uh, and then me and three of my colleagues, uh, two from the University of Toronto and one from uh, York University, a lawyer, we applied as a team and it was a competition that it took like a few phases that you have to submit proposal and then you have to do presentation and then they ask you questions and then you have to address the question. It was a lot of work and early July we got the news that we were selected to be one of the three teams 
that um, and since July, I would say even since April, that I got the news, my life was 24 seven on that, right? So uh, I'm still detoxing from CBDCs, to be honest, right? I mean, uh, for the last two weeks, yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so... It was every day it was a lot of work. Okay, so, okay, I'm, okay let, let, if I had to like kind of go to the heart of maybe my where, my, where my mind is going right now, right? Which maybe other people are thinking. So you started this conversation off with, uh democracy freedom you talked about you know things you know whatever right uh the internet you talked about how netscape and all of that felt like that we were bringing more freedom i assume when you saw BitTorrent, you felt the same type of energy right and then when you saw bitcoin maybe you felt mm. even more so that hey look like freedom is ethereum, no, no, yeah. ethereum, ethereum, me, ethereum. sorry the for you ethereum. ethereum yeah the ethereum when i saw ethereum was like oh my god this looks right like- you're like oh my god the, like the world could be changed but now um some argue that cbdc's might be going in the other direction right it's like right. well they're you know whatever whatever this is the government's way of maybe whatever so we're just curious like what, what, what what's the what's the as somebody who's seen this uh, industry, let's say, emerge. You know what some of the principles and kind of the things that that, that people in this space hold near and dear. So curious, like, is, what what can people get excited about here? Um, uh, that's a very good. Uh, first of all, that's a uh, that's a very compound question and a very good question, right? Uh, I guess uh, it's not only a good question; it's the center of all the questions. It's the question of all questions. <laughs> Let me put it that way. <laughs> um, it's the question about the question of the question of the questions. Yeah, it's the question of all questions. Actually. Okay. Um, okay, so, you know... Next question. Yeah, no, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll go tell you. So let me, let me tell you, I mean, for us... I'm the first author in this 75 page proposal. I saw your name, yeah. Yeah, and uh, for me, it was imperative to protect people's data and privacy. Mm. Uh, now, it's easier said than done because there's AML, KY, uh, AML, CFT, uh, uh, other money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism yep. uh, uh, provisions, right? Mm-hmm. But our proposal in a nutshell, what it does, it completely, it requires KYC, know your customer. Uh, it then, because you cannot start giving Canadian digital dollars to every Mickey Mouse, non-Canadian, right? It needs, you know, the, the digital currency is paramount for the sovereignty and, and protection of a country, right? Not only security and everything. Um, but for us, privacy was paramount. So... All the transactions are anonymous. Nobody's able to track down. And only the central bank overnight does AML CFT. And it does that using homomorphic encryption. And unless something triggers, they don't know even what they're parsing. Homomorphic encryption allows you to do operation over encrypted data without revealing the identities of the data, right? And what happens is if an AML provision triggers, like basically I know that this money was coming from a criminal, a proven criminal, and I see Sunny using this money. I don't know it's Sunny yet, but it will tell me this record is using this money. It's like, these are standard procedures, the AML, right? So there's no surveillance over there. AML is like, AML is like, you cannot drive more than like a hundred kilometers an hour. What can you do, right? I mean, it's the law. What can we do, right? Uh, unless this triggers, nobody's gonna know your identity, right? So for now, why this is important? This is important for multiple reasons. Uh, we're going technologically into a period of time that we're gonna have IoT everywhere, Internet of Things devices everywhere. Myself, yeah. apart from my cell phone, I have nothing else. I recently replaced my thermostat over here. And they asked me, do you want to put this new one, which is like da da da? You can handle through your Android phone. It's like, yeah, fuck yeah. no. <laughs> right? I don't have an Alexa. I can show you. Actually, Google sent me this Google Assistant. It's still in the box. 
They say, we give it to you for free. You just pay 10 bucks for the postage. I say, fuck it, let me get it. And I got it and it's still in the box. I can go in my storage room and you can see it over there, boxed, not even the seal is still over there. I don't want those things, right? Because technology today allows, and that's what the Snowden revelations uh, indicated. Uh, that's what the Cambridge Analytical uh, scandal indicated from Facebook. Uh, and also that's what Canada fought against because you know the Skywalk project here in Toronto got canceled, right? It got canceled in 2020 because there were some brave people, including Anne Kavukian. I'm sure you heard Anne speaking in local engagements. She was the information commissioner of Ontario back in the days. She's now fighting the Ryerson. That she preaches privacy and security, right? So through this project, we wouldn't be able to have that. So going back to your question, uh, what we proposed was something very, very anonymous. And it gives to the public the opportunity in our design to say, hey, CIBC, CIBC for those who don't know is a bank over here, big bank. CIBC, I can give you my data if you give me perks back, right? Otherwise, I'll give you my data. Right. So the way that, you know, if I am to put it in a little bit more layman's terms, uh, in my case, because I do trust the Bank of Canada, right? Uh, it's not that I don't trust the Bank of Canada, it's about I don't trust Google or Facebook or all those guys. So basically, me or you have no say against Google or Twitter or LinkedIn or anybody who's tracking your data or Apple. Uh, but but Bank of Canada, our government has. So they can negotiate with them to protect us. Me, I cannot. Which is, if you think about it, is what happened in Europe a couple of years ago with the GDPR, the uh, data protection regulation that they introduced to protect Europeans. Which, if you think about it, that's what happened in China that they don't allow Google and Facebook over there because they didn't trust them. Right? You have to go through VPN and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so I agree with you, though, because if you read the, the European Central Bank released uh, uh, a very comprehensive paper about the digital euro back in uh, late September, I believe it was, right? Uh, late September. And over there, they say, well, we need to respect privacy, but everything that happens should be available to us, right? Uh, the Fed has been very slow on issuing CBDCs, but the digital dollar and other people south of the border, they also take a position that, you know, there's not gonna be privacy. The government's gonna know everything about you. But for me, that's a very scary proposition because they will know what food you eat, uh, where you drive, what gasoline, you, they're gonna know everything about you. And today data is money, right? So um, to conclude your question, uh, I think it will take a lot of uh, uprising from the people to change those things. Right, uh, about the KYC and AML. But okay, so that's one. So that's KYC, the, AML. And privacy. Okay, no, no, AML, oh, CFT has to be there. But uh, like completely wiping out your privacy is not AML, CFT. AML, CFT, because I've done a lot of legal, there are specific rules that you have to abide, just like you don't drive over 100 kilometers an hour, right? Or you get a ticket. No, I meant KYC. But getting I mean... all your data is a different mm. thing, though. Mm. But this is happening today already. With oh, okay, so just to summarize in my words, you're saying that uh, with the system that at least you've proposed um, and that, that the government's taking quite seriously, or the Bank of Canada rather, privacy is valued at its core and, and you know... It's one it's, of the top priorities, yeah. Okay, another big question for me is, is supply, okay? I, I don't know exactly how much money the Bank of Canada has put into the system over the last, uh, let's say, six months or a year. But from what I'm hearing, there's a lot of opaqueness around it. And then some people are happy, some people aren't. But 
but it, it, does does this project you're working on speak to that as well supply or is this some like thing that they just launch on no, the side supply, that you know no, people no, use no, no. supply no uh, supply Nothing. the digital dollar it will be uh like with Bitcoin, I know there's 21 million. That matters to me as a Bitcoiner or Ethereum, for example. They, they're very clear. It's disinflationary, blah, blah, blah. Is this just tied to the Canadian dollar and it is just what it's it is? Or, basically, or is, it will be yeah. a liability for the Bank of Canada. So every mm. loony got it. Is backed by some treasury bond, whatever, by the Bank of Canada. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, yeah. So, well, if they want to cut more bonds or treasury notes or whatever they, they can do it right but over there i don't have no say but hey, this yeah, is not yeah, for the bank of canada but for every cbdc the cbdc is a liability of the central bank that's the general basically understanding for cbdc's right mm. it's a liability of the central bank that issues that I, I, I don't know if you heard, but two weeks ago, Stephen Harper, our former prime minister in Canada, was asked about, do you think Bitcoin would ever be on the, the balance sheet of central banks? And he, he actually, he didn't say yes, but he didn't say no. And he kind of alluded that maybe, that maybe, that, that, that there's a world where, you know, we could potentially have. Do you, do you think that's even possible, knowing what you know now, having kind I of worked with? So. Never, the only, eh? <laughs> the, only, the only thing that it can be... The, okay, so I will I will be very honest because you know me for many years. <clears throat> the only thing that it is on the balance sheet of several banks is what? It's gold. And gold... Wait, but it's not. But our dollar is not tied to gold. That that, that you said yeah, makes it untied. It's an asset for all settled banks. Right. But but do we have much gold? I thought Canada gave away its old gold. Actually, yeah. I, you, I was about to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> given, uh, given a so what is it backed by then? Uh, by taxes and by revenues through taxes right now. But, but you know, the, the gold has traditionally been hmm. an asset for all central banks. And if you see India, Russia, China, hmm. they increased the depositories of gold in the last uh, decade, decade and a half. The United States has been stable. The IMF actually, something you may not know, is the third biggest holding agency in the world in terms of gold, right? Uh, I would be very surprised to see Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other in the balance sheet of... Uh, <laughs> hey, Tesla, Tesla, come on. You heard about that, no? Would you I have mean, imagined? I want me to hear about Tesla. I mean, I mean I'm not an Elon Musk advocate over here, right? <laughs> I, mean, I don't even call him by name. I call him car salesman, so... Okay. Okay. Salesman, well, yeah. uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next one. So what else? So I guess, tell me about any, anything else you want to share on the project uh, that you've been working on? I mean, just, I don't know, exciting things. Well, or the things project that you... came to a close because when it went public and that was like two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I received uh, quite a bit uh, of positive comments from a lot of, you know, from the IMF, even from Facebook, from cool. a few other settled banks. I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud about the work that, uh, those four faculty, my three colleagues and myself put for the last nine months. And, uh, and I do know that the uh, Bank of Canada is taking it very seriously. Um, they haven't issued any statement that they will issue CBDCs, but uh, the deputy governor gave a talk the day before those proposals came public and he even coined our term digital loony, right? So wow. said, yeah, what a cool, and look, yeah. And that was actually this really was my idea. Uh, I liked it, right? CBDL, not CBDC, right? Hey, do you think this Dinesh gentleman might be willing to speak at all, or do they are they very private? I, they're very I, private. They're, they're very, very private. I'm on Twitter, I think. I think or one of the people from Bank of Canada. <laughs> no, they do. No, I'm, of course they have to be on Twitter and stuff, right? And they advertise the jobs, but. They're very private. I mean, he he does. Uh, Dines does. Uh, Dines does. Uh, Dines Shah does uh, talks to conferences. But cool. generally speaking, Bank of Canada is a very tightly knitted environment, and I can tell you with a great amount of respect because I've talked to many people in my life. They're gentlemen, very serious, very knowledgeable, very down to earth, uh, very polite, and. Uh, uh, they're far away from politicians. I can tell you, they're they, they have a, a mandate to protect the country. Now we need to understand what the Bank of Canada does. It's not what the Bank of Canada decides many times. It's what the politicians decide, right? So we need to dissociate those two things. 
but uh, we should be sure and, and uh, here in this country that we have a fine set of people in that central bank to try to protect us. The Bank of Canada does have, I mean, it should technically have some level of autonomy from the politicians, no? I mean, isn't that kind of the point of, of having a central bank? Yeah, but then you go to the parliament and they vote something. What do you do, right? Mm. <laughs> the Bank of Canada is like they're just executing. I mean, they will tell you what they want. And if you hear them, fine. If you don't hear them, you know. Well, but what a huge responsibility, you know, that they have on their shoulder to like print the dollars that all of us go and, go and earn. They still print a lot, actually. Yeah. I, 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 uh, M1, M2. I heard, yes, I heard this week in the United States, they just stopped showing M2. They're just like... That page just unnecessary. <laughs> so loud, doesn't fit. <laughs> like yeah, people don't care. It's okay. Um, I mean, most you, you know, you know, Sunny, this is not gonna end up very well, right? What? Printing dollars. Oh no! I thought it was gonna be amazing. I thought, I mean, isn't that the solution to all of life's problems? Just print your print money out of thin air as much as you can. I thought it was. I never got a free lunch. In my why? Why? As in, as in somebody who's helping. I mean, or not helping, but as a professor. I mean, how, why would you say that though? Printing money doesn't help. Um, because you know, I, I'm not the only one saying that. A lot of uh, scholars or important people in the last year they have said that. We live in times that the gap between the super rich and the middle class gets bigger. And uh, with all due respect to those people that suffered due to the pandemic or lost people uh, in this pandemic uh, or whatever is happening, uh, it's been a year that those stores out there, they're closed. Actually, I was reading at Block TO, Block Toronto yesterday, that some... Um, stores are making alliances that we're not into this together anymore. We're not together anymore because they say, how can you allow Walmart uh, be open as essential business and you, and you go in the wall, I haven't been to Walmart myself, but and you see all these people packed and waiting in line and you don't allow stores to open and allow even one customer at a time to come in, right? So this thing has a humongous impact on the, uh, on uh, the economy and the middle class, right? Mm -hmm. um, as far as printing money, we see people like Elon Musk going from 25 billion, that was his property a year ago, to 175 billion, right? Um, mm -hmm. I know that uh, you're locked right now in your home, although you have this nice fancy background behind you. It's uh, not a background, it's really, it's, it's real. Yeah. It's real. Of course. Yeah, Toronto, the tower. But your head is your get head is away. Open. Yeah, I should get out of the way. There yeah, you, you have to do that, man. We have to sit in the middle. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I mean, we don't travel nowhere. Uh, if you are to travel, you have to come back. You get fifteen days of uh, quarantine, right? Whatever this involves. The super rich they have their private jets. I mean, I know that Bill Gates was at the Bermuda for a month and a half in late August and September. Uh, you see all of them, the Kim Kardashians posting pictures from like all these Caribbean islands, right? So there's no quarantine for them. So um, I don't think that printing money is going to end up very well, to be honest. I don't know how, but I, I would not be, I would not be, um, you know, nobody gave a free lunch to nobody, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, our, our children will pay off, uh, you know, whatever uh, debts or inflationary problems we have in the future, you know, it's okay. <laughs> no, you, I know you love your children. <clears throat> and for me, the they'll, they'll pay it off. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm just saying, I'd rather, I'd rather, I think let's print as much as we can now and let's in debt and sl turn our children into slaves. I, I, I kind of like that That's idea. That's a good idea. Yes. Yeah, man. They got the energy. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm kidding no 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 I, I agree i mean this is why we're all in and i think we do have also a bigger problem in the name of global warming right you barely saw any snow in toronto this year right you barely saw any snow come on the snow we had this year was equivalent to snow we we're getting three days 15 years ago mm. 
Right? Yeah, but, but we had quite a bit of snow over the last week. No, I mean, I was, I was shoveling. That was nothing. How long have you been in Toronto? But you were in and out, in and out, in and out all your life. Well, mind you, yeah, I've, I've been in a house in a while. I was living in buildings. Okay, so let's go back to your story. So we, we got your story. We got this exciting, you know, stuff you're working on with CBDCs. And I think that's, that's fascinating. Um, what is one thing, so just kind of bring it home now, because I, I don't want to take up your whole Friday night. Um, what is one thing that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? Most others in, you know, in our industry would disagree with you on, let's say. The Ethereum rules. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I know, I know. That's the worst thing you can say to a Bitcoin advocate, that the Ethereum rules. There's still uh, this kind of animosity between the two communities. Um, I, I do feel that, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be a pessimist. I'm just looking things and, you know, I'm a computer scientist. I like to add numbers, right? And one plus one always makes two to me. So uh, I do feel that right now we do have a lot of asset bubbles. Uh, there's a lot of volatility in not only Bitcoin or Ethereum, but in every other asset. You've seen everything being parabolic. The only asset, I mean, you just talked about Tesla, but just go and see NASDAQ, so the Dow, uh, CEO, a lot of companies going like parabolically up. The only asset that has not been parabolic actually has been gold, if you think about it. Gold is only 10, 15% over its... Um, 10-year moving average, maybe 18% or something like that, right? Um, I would not be, I know people speaking Bitcoin to 100,000. Actually, yesterday, I, as you called in by accident, you saw me with uh, my friends breaking our quarantine. Uh, they believe, yeah, on video. I hope I don't get uh, a lawsuit. Because, <laughs> You're like right? the second or third person that said it. I, I'm probably going to get banned from YouTube soon, but whatever. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of backups. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. good. Yeah, you got to censor this part of the interview. Wow, well, I'm on the days. Yeah. Beep. Yeah. Um, Beep. The things got to go to a million dollars. Um, I think we're optimistic. Uh, I, I need to raise caution that that the big money, the traditional financiers, they don't like Bitcoin, they don't like Ethereum. Why? Because they steal their lands. What they do, the billions of dollars that we pay today in fees, unnecessary. If you see the trend, just like the music industry that I spoke, the trend in the last 20, 25 years, technology cost goes up, banking fees go up, right? So they don't match. So for them, Ethereum or Bitcoin is not a friend because it's stealing their lands eventually, right? So, but those guys have all this money, just like they do in Wall Street every day to move the assets up and down, up and down to their benefit, right? So if there is any crash, like there was a crypto winter like two years ago, uh, I wouldn't be surprised that they do it to badmouth the system and people lose uh, trust into the system, right? I'm adamant that decentralization, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, or the next project that is going to come, all this beautiful system that you know very well, right? The decentralized finance, uh, these cross-chain swaps, this is an amazing, beautiful system that we've built out of nowhere, right? It's a very powerful system. And I do believe that it's our last hope for democracy. We cannot afford to have bubbles that burst, hmm. but they're gonna shake the trust of the average person into that system, right? That's where I'm going, right? So I don't share the view that, uh, that you know, I, I don't know what price is fair for Bitcoin or Ethereum, but this price of like a harder or 200 or 260 reminds me a little bit the dot-com era mm. i remember i was getting wall street journal at that time and i was reading all these dot-com all this price this projects this project this and one day you woke up it was a boom like that right and it was a big shock um my advice is for people to protect this ecosystem of decentralization and the spirit of decentralization because this is our uh last hope against what's going on with the central authorities, right?
Yep, 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 so yep, I don't, yep. I don't say it. Yeah, I know th this may sound controversial to some, right? Um, but, you know, I'm not a hopeless romantic, I'm a hopeful romantic. You lost it over there. <laughs> I don't know where to go. I just heard romantic twice and I kind of paused. Okay. Listen, no, man. I'm not a hopeless romantic. I'm a hopeful romantic. Hopeful. Okay. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Well, you're, I, you are definitely romantic. Yeah. You know, I told you I went to Greece once with my brother. My, my, after I graduated, my dad sent me out. My parents sent me out. Sent my brother. Oh, your dad. Yeah. He paid. Your yeah. He pay. paid. It was our, it was our good. Good You made it. You made it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we, we did that, a Contiki yeah. trip and we we went to Corfu. That was like my highlight of my trip too. That was my favorite place, like one of my favorite places. Nice, on Earth. But you should go so much the, fun. Huh? You should go to the Aegean Sea, like Mykonos, Sandorini, mm. but Corfu is very classy island. It has so a little beautiful. Of, it has a little bit of Italian taste also. Yeah. Very yeah. classy though. Corfu is a very nice island. Okay. Hey, you know, before we finish this off, do you have any thoughts about AI in general? Like, do you think this technology that we're working on, whether it be CBDCs, Bitcoin, Ethereum, do you think this stuff, like one of the concerns, like if you read Kai Fuli's books and all this is that our data is pre pretty much in the hands of two governments and five or six companies, right? So um, uh, AI feeds off of data. And so I worry about this future where, you know what I mean? Where all of our data, like you said, is centralized. I wonder, is there a future where it, we can have the benefits of AI, but where it doesn't necessarily need to feed off of this like centralized data repository? The, essentially, our proposal for CBDC, that's what we propose, that people take control of the privacy, which in effect, they take control of the data because data today is security, it's money, it's a lot of things. Um, just like I spoke about the Bitcoin price before, I'm also a little bit dystopian when it comes to the data, because as you very well said, everybody, whether it's the government or the private corporation, they're chasing my data and your data and everybody's data. So certainly, certainly, as I said, as people, unfortunately, the trend is not very positive. The trend goes against what you said, right? And we should be worried. And because we are worried, that's why we need to go out in the streets. That's why we need to protest. That's why we need to be aware of what's going on and not just get like a good return in the stock market and feel we're happy. They give us like a little bit, you know, mouth fed, you know, reward and we think life is, and they give us a good Netflix, Netflix movie or they give us a discount on Spotify because data is the biggest thing that, uh, you know, and now we're talking about digital IDs, you know, through digital IDs that will be able to track everything about you, right? So it's getting even more terrifying. So I think it's up to the people. I think we will need social unrest to stop what it's coming. And I'm not promoting any social unrest over here, but I do feel that people would need to go out in the streets just like, I mean, at the end of the day, if you see, you know, traditionally, especially the last hundred years, or especially the last 70 years, that there was some kind of equality between the classes, it took some revolutions, it took some people going out the streets to change things for the better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's not forget that, you know, things have not changed a lot. But today we're moving in a direction, unfortunately, that data will be captured by the governments and by a few corporations with whatever this entails, right? So I just hope this would not become the case. Yeah, but yeah. Also, yeah, we're moving into that. And, 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 you know, and one of the things I do touch on, I'm, I'm asking about this less and less, uh, but Ubi, right? Like you talk about, oh, our stock market goes up. Oh, they give us a bit of Netflix. You know, oh, they give us a bit of that universal basic income, which also I think a lot of Bitcoiners from doing this episode, this video thing I'm doing, uh, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of people are like very anti universal basic income. And, and I think I'm waking up to that fact as well, is that maybe it's not because it's kind of like creating, you know what I mean? Like everyone's like dependency on the state essentially. Right. And it's like, they're taking away our ability to, you know, kind of like earn money. Getting, and, yeah. You, UBI, we don't know what it is yet. 
uh, we've been listening to it about like from Mr. Zuckerberg for the last uh, and some others for the last three, four years. But again, I'm going to say this, nobody's going to give you a free lunch, right? That's not my experience in life. Exactly. I always, I always got what I had because I worked a lot and I know that you also work a lot, right? Yep. You never came, you know, and sometimes you did good things and you made Sometimes you did good things, but you didn't make. That's how life is, but you yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but UBI, uh, you know, right now they're talking that they may take property rights away. Fuck. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I've heard yeah. that. So, okay. so I think that will be a very interesting decade, if you ask me, to see how it's going to play out, right? It's going to be a very, very interesting decade. Would I, I don't want to comment about UBI because I don't know any more to what you know. You do, yeah, but, yeah. But, but the money that they cut is money that they need to make from somewhere else through taxation, right? So I don't know. I really don't know where. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, don't yeah. know. Yeah, how this is gonna be implemented? Why it's gonna be implemented? Um, and I just hope that um, you know things don't change. You cannot change the social structure for the last uh, seven thousand years in just overnight, right? Yeah, 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 I hear you, man. You okay, cannot, uh, uh, that's things that are in our DNA overnight. Yeah. So, Andres, you know, my my theme is kind of like I know you you had your aha moment with Ethereum, but you know, Ethereum was inspired by Bitcoin, right? To be fair, of course. So my yeah. my my kind of theme is building on Bitcoin, right? So, what I try and encourage people to do in my show is that, yeah, you can get buy it, get rich, or whatever, whatever. But there's more to it, meaning you can actually devote your life. You can write a book, you can build a business, you can do events, you can, you know, if you're a professor, you can um, do research in this space as well. And so um, any any parting words to others who are maybe in your position or a similar position who are kind of on the fence? Bitcoin, and- yeah, Bitcoin is the king. I mean, Bitcoin right now has become, and I think it's for good, a store of value, which is very important, right? Uh, Bitcoin, if it is protected by the ecosystem, ecosystem means the participants, it can become a long-term store of value. So we don't have to depend on settled banks anymore. We can create our own economies, our own borderless economies, right? Uh, as, as far as we believe into what we do and we put our money where our mouth is, then we create our own central bank, which is controlled by us or actually by the Bitcoin protocol and so forth, right? Um, so what I will advise people is to, uh, Bitcoin is not only to trade or Ethereum is not only to trade. Bitcoin is an asset and all this ecosystem, because don't forget, Bitcoin is not stand alone right now. You have like bridges with other chains, and so forth, like because Bitcoin is the king of all assets, essentially, if you think about it, uh, for people to learn and try to build their career onto this course of decentralization. Because this will be a much more robust future than the one that we're getting from our governments, right? So it's not only, uh, I hate when people come and tell me, oh, do you think it's going to go up, this and that, this and that, and I'm, obviously I don't, give advice because I'm not in, 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 not in uh, somebody who does investment advice, obviously. But what for me is the beauty of all these things is the concept of decentralization. They exist because we believe in them and because we run our computers to keep them running. So now don't look at the value, look at the prospects of what these ecosystems provide to you to prosper, right? And to do things in a fair way. Andres, you know, in India, that's well said. In India now, as you know, they're also, you know, exploring very deeply this idea of CBDCs. I know some of the people actually that are kind of working on it as well. Um, any any thoughts? I mean, you you did in a, so I know I'm kind of going back into a conversation, but I, I this is one thing I wanted to touch on quickly. You also kind of mentioned Aadhaar, uh, the Aadhaar uh, national identity in India, and you mentioned how that was also referenced in your paper several times. But any thoughts around like you know, okay, China's been doing it for seven years. Canada looks like they're 
you know, kind of deep down that tunnel um, or that rabbit hole. And then what about any thought? Yeah. India, have you looked at that, that landscape and what they're doing other than Aadhaar card as well? Or uh, No, unfortunately, no. I mean, I read very recently that they're again, preparing regulation to ban all cryptocurrencies. Um, I don't know how true or not this is, right? How it's going to fly or not. I remember that they did ban cryptocurrencies like a couple of years ago, like three years ago, and then they opened it up again uh, two years <laughs> ago. But uh, but um, I really don't know. I, I'm not. I, I don't talk to the Central Bank of India, right? So I don't have any. And fair enough, fair enough. And but what was it about the Aadhaar uh, project that you found interesting? What What I found interesting is the Aadhaar provided, number one, digital ID in a fair way because it's encrypted. The government is not taking your data. It's highly encrypted, right? The amount of privacy that Aadhaar provides to the participants is of very high quality, right? So for me... And the second thing through Adher now you can do payments that are also encrypted, right? You go with your phone, you scan that, da, da, and the guy that you buy from doesn't know who you are. He knows he got his money, but he, he doesn't know who you are and vice versa, right? Okay. So, and it's a system that what was, I mean, for me, the number one thing was like the amount of protection this system had for the public, right? Mm -hmm. That was very important. The second thing is that India, because I read extensively about it, um, India managed to get over 700 million people on board in just like five years, right? And we're talking about a country where people don't, a significant amount don't even have access to technology. Yet those guys, they went and they registered and they got an ad hoc card, right? And the system, of course, it had glitches along the way. Uh, it had also regulatory glitches, but now it's been running for what? For like seven years, eight years, whatsoever, and it runs fine. And it works for one of the biggest, uh, India is the second biggest country in the world, right? In terms of population, right? It works fine. So that was that they were able, the government of India to, to modernize payments uh in such a secure way was an amazing thing for me very cool very cool and by the way on that note so yeah maybe maybe i'll explain another one but yeah so a couple of years ago it was the central bank that tried to prohibit banks from dealing with cryptocurrency companies it was actually our our company along with others that challenged that in the supreme court and then all three judges decided that uh, it was unconstitutional and uh, and, you know, for the last year, our business has been up and running. Uh, but then more recently there now the government is, is introduced, trying to introduce a bill or they've introduced a bill that effectively would ban Bitcoin. Um, yes. Obviously, there are a lot of efforts uh, that are taking place right now that I can, some I can talk about, some I can't, you know, there's lots, lots going on on that front. Uh, I'm going to be doing some special videos just talking to that in the next week as well. So I'll leave it for that one. I, I um, will oh, see them actually. Yeah, yeah, I'll share with you. I've been, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people out there. Like I said, Please it's, too, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Andrew, this has been amazing, man. I know it's super late. I know it's Friday. You probably had a long week, but thank you. Thank you so much, man. Is there anything you want to share? You, thank you at my end to have to see you. I mean, I miss you, brother. I mean, yeah, man. It's been too long. I can't wait till all this is behind when us. Gonna, when the guy let us out of our homes. Like, I mean, if you go I'm up and down Young Street, yeah. I mean, Young Street always had crazy people because you didn't close by. Yeah. But now it has only crazy people. Like if you walk out at night downtown Toronto, mm. I would say like 70% of the people, like after nine o'clock at night, they're like cuckoos, you know? Either certified cuckoos or people that turn into cuckoos, right? So I hope, well, that... but I'm, I'm afraid that we might, you know, we might end up with this uh, situation for another year and a half, maybe two years. I would not be surprised. <sighs> I'm not going to lie, Andres. I, I have a lot of thoughts around this, uh, most of which I am not sharing publicly. <laughs> I, 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 was about, I was about to say the same thing. Yeah. Let's just put it this way. If I once, share once right thought, stop, I'd be bad. Hey, hey, hey. hey. Once you stop the recording. <laughs> Once you stop the okay, once you stop the recording, yeah, yeah, okay. Sure okay, let's kill this one. Okay, we're done. 